So I read about an exhibit that once appeared in New York's Museum of Natural History. The designer of the exhibit arranged a room so that it looked like a normal room, but from a dog's perspective. So unless your dog walks around on two legs, it'd be pretty amazing if he does, the perspective he has on a room is much different than your perspective in a room. And so in this particular room, when you walked in, you had these table legs that look like giant pillars, a chair that looks like a king's throne, the mantle of the fireplace looks like a giant precipice on a mountain. This exhibit caused one author to ask some deep questions. He asked, which was reality? The room as it looked to a dog or the room as it looked to a man or woman? Being men and women, we say, of course, that the room as we see it is the real one. But may there not be a divine eye as much above ours in perception as ours is above the dog's. You see what he's saying? That we have difficulty seeing the world beyond our own perspective. And it's impossible for us to see the world as God sees it. And this limitation is acknowledged throughout Scripture. Have you noticed that when you read the Bible, it reads different than a history textbook? And that's because our perspective is limited. So the Bible can't simply report events historically and assume that we would understand their significance. We don't have that kind of perspective. And so the Bible is written acknowledging that we have this limited, distorted perspective on life and that we need events interpreted for us. We need to see them from God's perspective. And so the word of God, when it reports events, not only tells us what happened, it tells us why it happened. And then it tells us what we should do about it. And so no matter what situation that we encounter in life, we need that situation interpreted for us. We, in fact, should be suspicious. This is part of spiritual maturity is we're suspicious of our own reading of what's taking place. And we learn to, in our suspicion about our own reading, we learn to trust the word of God and the spirit of God to help us really make sense of what's happening. Especially in times of suffering. In times of suffering, we need a correct perspective and it's not a perspective that we can arrive at on our own, in our own strength, in our own ability. So there's an old saying, maybe you've heard it, to a hammer everything looks like a nail. Well, there, there's sort of the opposite is true, that if you're a nail, I bet everything feels like a hammer. So when the hammer just keeps falling, all you can see, all you can feel are the blows of the hammer. Think about the, the example of Job in the Old Testament. He's righteous and he's upright. He walks with God and yet he's unable to understand the purpose of his suffering without God's help. See, what happens usually during seasons of suffering is that we rely upon our emotions to interpret our situation. So we're like a kite, and our perspective on life and circumstances travels wherever the winds of emotion blow us. And what Jesus does in our text this morning is he gives us truths that protect us from the winds of emotion. He reveals a number of truths about suffering in this letter to the church in Philadelphia. Now, this is not the city in Pennsylvania, but the one in ancient Turkey. This is the sixth of the seven letters that Jesus wrote to ancient churches, but are intended for all churches. And so this letter is written to a church that feels like it's living under a rain cloud, a church that feels like it never sees the sun. Now, I'm fascinated by the contrasting perspectives between the church in Sardis, which we looked at last week, and this church in Philadelphia, because I think... The church in Sardis, when it got Jesus' letter, it was thinking like, everything here is really, really great. And then it reads Jesus' letter and it's like, no, it's not. I think the church in Sardis was probably the opposite. They're looking around, they're like, everything here is terrible. And they read Jesus' letter and Jesus says, you guys are doing great. See, when we're suffering, the tears in our eyes cloud our perspective about God, about ourselves, and about our suffering. And so here's what we see. In this letter to Philadelphia, Jesus exposes three wrong views of suffering. These are ways we normally look at suffering, but Jesus, he corrects our suffering so that we'll be prepared in our times of suffering and for suffering that is still to come. Here's the first wrong perspective that a church can develop on suffering. It's that suffering feels like God is not in control. Suffering feels like God is not in control. Have you ever felt this? 
in your suffering? I don't know if you've driven through the mountains, but if you've driven through the mountains, you see periodically these, these ramps on the side of the road for semi-trucks. And they're there because apparently going down mountains enough, a, a semi-truck's brakes can overheat and they can stop working. And so they have these, these uphill ramps filled with sand. And so they, I guess, plow into it. I'm so thankful. All the times I've driven through mountains, I've never witnessed this in person. But I just think about that, that semi-driver who he, he understands uh, there's a little bit of danger. He understands there's a little bit of problems. Maybe he's going down this mountain and all of a sudden something happens and it's like, whoa, things got real. And all he's hoping for is to see one of those ramps and hope that that ramp is there and it'll save him and protect him from utter chaos. And I think that's a little bit how suffering feels like. We, we're like, okay, things aren't great. Things are going downhill. And then all of a sudden we reach this point where we're like, where is the exit ramp? Like, how, am I going to make it out of here without utter chaos and destruction? What it feels like is that we're barreling down the side of a mountain with no brakes, no control, and we're just at, we're at the mercy of whatever happens next. And this letter is, is telling us this very, very clear. Events in your life may feel like they are spiraling out of control but God is always in control. It may feel from our perspective like we're, we're barreling down the hill and there's no way to stop us, but the problem is our perspective. See, this letter begins like each of the letters has by pulling some of the characteristics from the vision of Jesus in chapter one. And the purpose of this description is to silence any doubt about who's in control of life's events. Look at the picture it paints about the sovereignty of Jesus in verse 7. So it says, Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. So there's two titles of Jesus in this verse. The first one is the Holy One, and then the true one. And these are designed to get us to think to the book of Isaiah and the sovereign control that is revealed by God over the nations. In fact, Isaiah's favorite title for God is the Holy One. And Isaiah was showing over and over that this Holy One is in control. For instance, Isaiah 40, verse 25, To whom will you compare me, or who is my equal, as the Holy One? Look up and see who created these. He brings out the stars by number. He calls them all by name. Because of his great power and strength, not one of them is missing. Those verses actually follow the description of God as the one who holds the oceans in the palm of his hand. The one who designed and constructed the cosmos like a careful carpenter. The one who measured out the universes with the length of his arm. The one who takes mountains and places them on his kitchen scale and and, and he weighs them till they're the appropriate size. And it says, brothers and sisters, when suffering makes you think your life is out of control, remember the Holy One, the one who sits upon the surface of the earth. He views the nations as a, a, a drop in a bucket. Nothing spirals out of his control. But he's not just the Holy One. We're also told he's a true one or the faithful one. So not is he the only the all-powerful, sovereign ruler of all creation, but he's also faithful to his people and his promises. He won't let trials and suffering and tribulation overwhelm his people because he has pledged his unfailing love to us. See, Jesus doesn't want this church in the midst of its tribulation and suffering, overwhelmed by circumstances, to be driven to despair. And so he reminds them, no circumstances ever affect my commitment to you. I am faithful. Not just faithful, I am the faithful one. And this faithful and true one is holding something in his hand, something that should bring us comfort in his hand is a key. It's called the key of David. Now, we know this isn't the only key that he's holding in his hand because we were told that he has other keys in chapter one. He's like the custodian at the school. He's got, he's got a whole set of keys. And so we learn in chapter one that he's got two keys, keys to death and keys to the grave. And so like, these death and, and, and judgment 
are under his control, they're under his authority, he's locked them away, only he has the power and the right to unleash them. But he says there's another key. It's not just the key for death and judgment, there's the key of David. This comes from Isaiah chapter 22. And this is the key to David's kingdom, or to the kingdom of the Messiah. That God has given the key to his eternal kingdom to Jesus, which means this, Jesus is not just sovereign over this world, he's sovereign over the next one as well. That the earthly kingdom that was centered in Jerusalem, pictured throughout the Old Testament, will become an eternal kingdom, a new Jerusalem where Jesus reigns on the throne forever and ever, and no one can open or shut the door to his kingdom except Jesus. He alone has the key which unlocks eternal joy in his presence. When I was young, I borrowed the keys to the car from my dad. He was playing in a church softball game, and you know how it is when you're in the middle of something as an adult, and uh, your child comes and asks for something. He, like, he's just trying to hurry. He gives me the keys, and as I'm walking away, he says, Josh, when you're done with the keys, put them someplace safe. As an obedient child, very obedient child, I did exactly what he said. I did exactly what he said, like down to the exact words. And so after the game, he came to me. He's like, we were getting ready to go. And he's like, Josh, where are the keys? And I said, Dad, I put them in a very safe place. Before I, before I shut the door, I put the keys in a very, very safe place. And there was a very kind policeman with a bent coat hanger who was able to unlock the car to get the keys out from the very, very safe place I had put them before I locked the car. See, Jesus is never going to lock away the key to his kingdom and need help retrieving it. Like, Jesus is not like I was as a little kid. He doesn't get flustered or forgetful. He's never overwhelmed by the craziness of life. He's sovereign. He can be trusted. Everything Jesus says will come to pass. And so he says here, if I have decided something, it's going to happen, and nothing and no one's going to stop it. Look what he says in verse 8. Look. I have placed before you an open door that no one can close. He has opened the door of the kingdom to them. No amount of suffering, no amount of persecution could ever close the door. So even when there's a situation where it's life feels like it's spiraling out of control, he's like, look at my promises. Cling to my promises. I have opened the door to heaven to those who believe and nothing will ever hinder me from keeping this promise. One author refers to this, I like this phrase, he calls it Jesus' holy stubbornness. Here's what he goes on to say. Think about what this statement says concerning our Lord's determination concerning you and your relationship to him. His mind is made up His will is resolute and unchangeable. His goal is clear and the means to its accomplishment are undertaken with an immutable and omnipotent commitment. There is a sense then in which we might reverently speak of his holy and righteous stubbornness when it comes to the welfare of his people. He simply won't allow anyone to slam shut the door he has opened. Brothers and sisters, when you're suffering, you will be tempted to doubt God's control in your life. And so you need to remember this, and nothing can change his mind. No threats, no accusation, no slander, that nothing can change his plans. Not sickness, not persecution, not economic collapse, and, and things that, that, that come into your life that shock you, that overwhelm you. Don't shock and overwhelm Jesus. So when the doctor gives you this report and you did not see it coming, Jesus knew. When when you get a call and this call makes your future seem like like all of a sudden we're on shaky ground, Jesus isn't shaking. And so listen, you, you have to grasp this truth when times are easy because this is the truth the devil will assault when things are tough. So the first wrong perspective is that suffering feels like God is not in control. Here's the second wrong perspective. Suffering feels like God disapproves of us. If Jesus is sovereign over all things, then why is this church suffering? And so here's what suffering caused to do. First, we doubt God's control. He must not really be in control because if he's in control and I'm suffering, then he must not love me. 
Jesus begins verse 8 with four simple words. He says, I know your works. I want, you to, I want you to try to imagine being a member of this church and receiving this letter. This church that is suffering. This church that is overwhelmed by persecution. And, and it's just overwhelmed by circumstance in life. And you receive this letter. And you hear this phrase, I know your works. And I think you're glad to hear that. And you're thinking one of two things will happen. Well, number one, Jesus knows our work, so Jesus will tell us what we're doing wrong so that we can fix it so the suffering will end. Or, number two, Jesus will see that what we're doing is right and that we shouldn't be suffering and the suffering will end. Because that's how we look at suffering, isn't it? That suffering, it's just the cause and effect of our choices, our our decisions. I, if I'm suffering, I must have done something wrong. I must have offended God. This must be punishment for something I've done. But look at how Jesus describes their works in verse 8. I know your works. You have but little power, yet you have kept my word. And you have not denied my name. Jesus doesn't criticize them for failing. He commends them for faithfulness. This church is not large. It's not influential, it's faithful, and faithfulness is what Jesus wants from his church. Verse 9 tells us they've been persecuted by those who claim to be God's people. They're Israelites by birth, and yet these persecutors are not really God's people. They're not Israelites by faith. And in spite of the persecution, in spite of the constant pressure to deny Jesus, to disobey his word, this church, with little power, little influence, has remained faithful. What does Jesus value in a church? Not size or influence, but faithfulness. Jesus doesn't measure a church based upon worldly measures of success, strength, effectiveness. He measures a church based upon their faithfulness to him, both in conduct and confession. They obey his word. They confess his name. Behavior and belief, deeds and doctrine this is the measure of a church that Jesus honors. Is this what we honor as a church? It's worth noting that Jesus never promises to tell anyone on the final day, well done, good and influential servant. He never says, well done, good and successful servant. Well done, good and powerful servant. This is what he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Is this what you're pursuing? They are faithful to Christ. They confess his name in spite of great suffering. They're obeying his word in spite of tremendous pressure. So why are they suffering? I mean, isn't this the question that we think like, is suffering reveal God's displeasure or is prosperity a sign of God's favor? Can I, can I determine God's view of me based upon my outward circumstances? Now, I think this church would say, our church, Redeemer, would say, no. We know better. We know outward circumstances are not an accurate barometer of God's pleasure. But do we believe that in the midst of our suffering? Do you really believe that when you lose your job? Do you really believe that when a family member dies, when, when those tests come back positive? Or do you wonder what you've done to make God do this to you? I mean, brothers and sisters, our story is one of being saved by grace, which is unmerited favor. And yet, how often do we relate to God on the basis of our works? Jesus was sacrificed. God gave his only son when we were his enemies. And yet now that we're his children, we act like we've got to do certain things to keep him happy with us and keep life smooth. I find the final phrase in verse 9 incredibly comforting. He says this, they will know that I have loved you. Someday those who persecute this church will learn that Jesus loves this church. And I wonder if part of the reason Jesus gives them this promise is so that they will hear and they will understand that their suffering is not born out of disapproval. That his love for them was not earned. His approval of them was not earned. And therefore, it cannot be lost. John Newton, who wrote the song Amazing Grace, was a pastor in 
England in the 18th century, he wrote a number of letters, and there's one particularly read letter he wrote that I just absolutely love. It's, you have to wade through it just a little bit. You know, 300 years ago, they talked a little different then. But just listen to what he's saying, and this reveals the perspective on suffering that I want to have. He writes this, At length, and without further apology for my silence, I sit down to ask you how you fare. So I'm writing this letter to ask you how you're doing. Then he says this, Afflictions, I hear, have been your lot. So I hear your suffering. And if I had not so heard so, I should have taken it for granted. For I believe the Lord loves you. And as many as he loves, he chastens. I think you can say, afflictions have been good for you. And I doubt not, but you have found strength according to your day, so that though you may have been sharply tried, you have not been overpowered. For the Lord has engaged his faithfulness to all his children, that he will support them in all their trials, so that the fire shall not consume them, nor the floods drown them. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying that suffering may not be a reflection of God's disapproval, but an evidence of his love. But isn't it easier to believe God loves us when life is smooth? Isn't it easier when everything's going well to believe God loves us, but his love cannot be measured in our circumstances? I don't know what kind of suffering we'll experience as a church. It does not seem that we're on the verge of the intensity of suffering and persecution that this church had. But here's the reality. The world we live in, the sin-cursed world we live in, if we're going to follow Jesus faithfully, if we're going to confess him, with our mouths, if we're going to obey him with our lives, there will be some level of suffering. It may just be the difficulty of doing that, walking upstream against a culture that's flowing fast downstream. It might be just that constant frustration of dealing with the sin that indwells us, that we hate so much, but we give into. It might be the rejection of the gospel by people we love, our friends and our family, maybe even at some point, actual persecution by those who hate God. I don't, I don't know. But regardless of what form the suffering takes, we must refuse to doubt God's love for us. See, in times of suffering, we're going to wonder, are we doing what's right? Maybe we're tempted to say, is this, is this God's way of expressing his disapproval with us? And in those times, and, and really long before those times actually come, we've got to resolve. We're going to keep his word. We're going to confess our allegiance to him no matter how difficult or challenging life gets. Don't let your suffering convince you that God disapproves of you, Christian. Here's the third wrong perspective. Suffering feels like it will never end. Have you ever been here? Have you ever found yourself saying with the psalmist, how long, oh Lord, how long? How long will we suffer? Will this ever end? And this letter is actually, the bulk of the letter is these promises that remind this church that suffering does end and on the other side of suffering is this glorious, eternal happiness awaiting them. The first of three promises is found in verse 9. This is the promise of vindication. He writes, note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you. This is quoting from Isaiah chapter 60. It's a prophecy of a time when the enemies of Israel will come and bow down before their feet. This is written to Israel when they're actually subjected and subdued by enemies. It says this in Isaiah 60, verse 14, The sons of your oppressors will come and bow down to you. All who reviled you will fall face down at your feet. They will call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel. But notice what Jesus does with this. He says it's, in this case, it's not Gentiles that are persecuted Israelites. It is those who claim to be followers of God because of their ethnic background, Jews by birth, that are actually persecuting Jews by faith or the sons of Abraham by faith. See, Jesus is saying a, a genuine Israelite is not someone who's born with a certain background, but one who's born spiritually, spiritually. 
And he says, because of the work of Jesus and what he did in conquering his enemies, one day those enemies will brought into, be brought into submission before him. And so to a church that looks and feels and by every indication is weak and they're helpless, they're distressed and persecuted, and any person with any type of understanding would look at them and say, clearly you're forgotten by your God. He doesn't love you. Jesus says, hold on, one day I'm going to clear it up. And those who persecuted you will be humbled before you when you are exalted at your place with me to rule and reign forever. He says, one day my love for my bride will be clear to all. One day all of the mockery and insults, the taunts and the cruelty will be forgotten when I put my love on display for everyone to see. The second promise is a promise of protection. Verse 10, because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. Some interpret this verse as referring to a time of testing to come in the future, but the context points us to the time of testing that this church in Philadelphia will face during their lifetime. This is a time of suffering that will affect both Christians and non-Christians. It's similar, though a little different, from what we read to the letter, the church in Smyrna. If you remember that, a, a few weeks ago when Matthew was here, preached on the, to another church that was suffering persecution, and, and God said, Jesus said to them, like, there's coming a 10-day trial. And he was looking back to the time of Daniel, similar to Daniel's trial, where you're going you're gonna to suffer, they're going to put some of you in prison, but I will hold you through. Similar to that, this time of testing, this word for testing is used throughout the New Testament to describe just the regular experience believers have trying to remain faithful in, an, in a sinful world. This verse actually sounds very similar to what Jesus prayed on the night before his crucifixion. When he prayed not that God would remove his people from suffering and tribulation, but that he would preserve them through it. Here's what he says in John 17 verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Jesus is not promising that his, his followers get to miss out on suffering. But he says, I'll be with you and I will preserve you through it. And this is why the only, the only command that he gives this church is to hold on. Hold on. When this time of suffering comes, church, when this time of intensity, of trials, when this happens, just hold on. And he's making this point, I will protect my people through whatever they face. There is nothing, whether it's a current trial or future suffering, that will cause Jesus to stop protecting his people. Just as they kept his word during past tribulation, he will keep them during future suffering. In fact, the language of this promise brings to mind the flood where God protects and he preserves his people through a judgment that falls on unbelievers. If you're not a Christian, let me just tell you that this promise of suffering for God's people has an end date. It only lasts for a little while, but God also promises on judgment on those who refuse to repent of their sin and that lasts forever. So let me just, let me just plead with you these promises the promise of vindication, of protection from judgment. These can be yours, but only if you repent of your sin and trust Jesus alone for salvation. You're surrounded by a group of sinners. And there's nothing unique or special about us. The only difference is that we have received the grace of Jesus by confessing our sin and trusting in him alone for forgiveness of sin and for hope in the future. So before you leave today, let me just encourage you, talk with someone Maybe someone brought you or invited you or you met someone or afterwards, I'd love to talk with you. We want you to know how these promises can be yours through Jesus Christ because these promises are only for those who repent of their sin and trust Jesus. The final promise in verses 12 and 13 is the promise of identification. He writes this, the one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. 
Where do you find your identity? We all find our identity, who we are somewhere, right? Some do it in their nationality. You know, it's, they, they, they get really excited about that. This is just how they view themselves as from a certain country and that defines so much about them. A lot of people find it in relationships. You know, I'm a, a husband, I'm a father, I'm a brother, and this is who I am, and this is the core of my, my being, and everything sort of comes from that. A lot of times it happens in work, my job, and, and this this goal I have, this advancement I'm getting, this is, this is really who I am. This is the measure of, of what I've accomplished. One author suggested that we can find our identity in the brands we purchase. He wrote this. I thought it was food for thought. He said, you can join any number of tribes on any number of days and feel part of something bigger than yourself. So you can belong to the Callaway tribe when you play golf or the Volkswagen tribe when you drive to work, or the Williams-Sonoma tribe when you cook a meal. You're part of a select clan, or so you feel, when you buy products from these clearly differentiated companies. Then he said this, Brands are the little gods of modern life, each ruling a different need, activity, mood, or situation, yet you're in control. If your latest god falls from Olympus, you can switch to another one. No matter where you find your identity, suffering has a way of exposing it as insufficient. So just imagine your identity is in your job. That when you think about who you are, you think about the work you do and, and the successes you had. And when you think about your life in the future, you're thinking about all of the different things you hope to accomplish. What happens then to your identity when you've been laid off? I think some of you have probably faced this. You would maybe even say, well, my identity is not in my job. And two months into being laid off, you're going, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Suffering, exposing your identity. Or your identity is in your family. What happens then when there's conflict? And, or what happens when someone dies? And you expose is like, I'm not sure. I'm not really sure. There's so many questions that raise about my future when this happens. Because you're, you're rooted in that identity. Or, or your identity is in your possessions. What happens when you have no means of buying something? Here's what we see. This is what Jesus is saying with these promises that when we suffer, we quickly find out where our identity is and then we discover how any identity apart from Jesus is insufficient. So here's the church in Philadelphia. They have been persecuted. They have likely been excommunicated from the synagogue. Quite possible they've lost their job or their means of employment that people, because of the excommunication, people would no longer, that they used to trade with and work with, would no longer, like, they'd be like, ah, oh, sorry, I can't, I can't do this with you. I might get in trouble next. It's quite possible their family relationships were lost with this as well. That mothers and fathers, that sisters and brothers are treating them like a pariah. So they've, they've lost this all. And so they're, they're, they're unrooted. Who am I? And here's what Jesus says, I, I have given you an unchanging, unassailable identity in me. He says, I'm going to make you a pillar in the temple. When the king stands up from his throne and he dismisses everyone from his throne room, you know who doesn't leave? The pillars holding up the roof. They're there. They're permanent. Everyone else, you get out. But guess what? Pillars can't go. And this is what Jesus is saying. You're going to be forever in my presence, unmovable. Not just that. You're going to be given names, the name of God. You're going to be given the name of New Jerusalem. You're going to give Jesus' own new name. Think about a kid who gets his first baseball glove. And somewhere in that baseball glove, he writes his name. Why? Because it belongs to him. And Jesus says, I'm putting three names on you. There's no question who you belong to. And so the promises here are promises of belonging, of acceptance. You might have been kicked out of the earthly synagogue. You might have been cast aside by your family. But no one will expel you from the presence of Jesus. And that's what he's promising. In fact, he's simply restating this promise God made in Isaiah 56. When he said, I will give them... In my house and within my walls, a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give each of them an everlasting name that will never be cut off. This church, this little 
insignificant church in Philadelphia has not denied the name of Jesus and as a result they will be given his eternal name. Men may cut them off but Jesus never will. No trial, no temptation, no tribulation is great enough to cause even one of these promises to fail. I want to end this time by just considering what can you do to prepare yourself for suffering? Maybe you're suffering right now and so these will just be reminders of how to hold on. Maybe you're not suffering and things are good. Let me just be the bearer of some bad news today. You're going to suffer. You don't get out of life without suffering. That, that's it's just the effects of sin on this world. You're going to suffer. Are you ready for it? As one of your pastors, one of my job is prepare you to suffer and suffer well. And so here's how we prepare. Three things. First, rehearse these promises. Rehearse these promises. When you're in the middle of a storm, it can be tough to remember the beauty of the blue sky unless you have spent lots of sunny days lying on your, on your back in the grass, staring up into it. And so this is what we want to do as a church. We want to just lie on our backs and stare up into the beauty of the gospel. We want to meet every week and we want to sing about it. We want to read about it. We want to talk about it. We want to mind ourselves about it so that when the storm clouds roll in, we remember the promises that are ours in Jesus. And even if that storm lingers a long time, we will not forget that our confidence in his promises will not waver. So rehearse these promises. Second, commit to faithfulness. There's a lot of things we could commit to as a church. We can commit to buildings and programs and events and growth and community involvement and they're all good things but there's one thing we should be most concerned about. Jesus' one command to them, verse 11, is hold on to what you have. Be faithful. I know your faithfulness will never make the headline of a newspaper in this world. Unfaithfulness does but not faithfulness. But it is headline material in the world to come. Because Jesus honors faithfulness. So let's, let's commit to faithfulness, no matter how hard life gets. Third, focus on Christ. Why were they able to endure? Because they kept Jesus' command. They, in the midst of their suffering, they focused on Jesus. They followed his example. They recited his words. They put into practice the first words of Hebrews chapter 12. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us. How? Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith for the joy that lay before him. He endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him. Think about him. Look to him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. Nothing prepares us for suffering like focusing on Jesus. Nothing comforts us in suffering like focusing on Jesus. Nothing strengthens us when suffering like focusing on Jesus. So in seasons of suffering, don't listen to your emotions Instead, look to him who suffered in your place. Don't trust your perspective. Trust the promises of a faithful Savior. Will you pray with me?